and said, God is love, and she reversed it. She said, love is God. See? But you can do that thing. For God is love. Well, that is no, God's a spirit. That is no, our God is a jealous God. That is no, our God is a consuming fire. See? There's more to it than that. And when you just get the positive part of it, see, like he never prophesies any good for me, but only good. When you get just the positive side of that thing, folks say, well, God's love, and then get rid of everything else about God. When you take all of God's attributes from him but love, you can say love is God. When you say love is God, then you can use human sex relationships as the supreme God. When you do that, you bring in the African jazz band and restore Balaam Ashtra, and you go right back to the general. A, a God that's all love, and I'm saying it real clear, a God that's all love and nothing else is a spiritual pervert. And I mean it. If God can't hate, and if he can't judge, and if he can't take vengeance on his enemies, he's not God. And when I read my Bible about God, I've got a God that's complete. The God I know is perfect wrath, and perfect mercy, and perfect love, and perfect justice, and perfect pity, and perfect hatred. You say, hatred for what? Hatred for sin. What do you think? And I'll tell you, a God that loves impurity, and unchastity, and perversion, and stealing, and swearing, and killing, and murder, and lying, and stealing, just like he loves purity, and courage, and goodness, and truth, is a spiritual pervert, and the quicker you kick him off the throne, the better it'll be for everybody. And that's what's wrong with this whole generation. I like what Joseph Parker said. He lived a hundred years ago. Joseph Parker said, this modern new God. He's nothing but just love, dressed up with the throne on his head, and some of you people think God's just a big old kiss sitting up in heaven. <laughs> that ain't it. You know these modern tunes, you know, you know, I see him in the mountain, he's in the little baby, he's in the little he's everywhere. Well, I see a mountain, I think it is love, you know, that kind of business. You know what they're doing? They're taking all the stuff about God, heaven, the Bible, and putting in the popular songs, and they're taking all the love and sex out of popular songs and putting them to him. You know, cry in the chapel, you know. Somebody's singing there, Lord above me, help him love me the way, Lord above me, you know, where he should, I got it bad, you know. You must be an angel on a visit from the skies, or build a stairway to the stars. It would be heaven to climb to heaven with you. <laughs> you know what they do? They took out a lot of heaven and God and stuff, put that in the popular stuff and debase it, and then take the stuff out of the popular stuff and put it in the hymns and debase the hymns. Now, I'll sing, My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. But you take that, My Jesus, My Jesus. Did you ever read that in the Bible anywhere? I mean, like, My Darling, My Little Baby Doll over here. Did you ever read that in the Bible anywhere? Well, I'll sing it. I understand the sentiments of the song. Because these quartets singing, Jesus, My Jesus. Nuts. <laughs> Listen, brother, uh, Jesus Christ is the Lord of lords and King of kings, the Lord of glory. And the real sentiment is more like Ferris, Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, O thou of God, man the Son, thee will I honor, thee will I cherish, my soul, salvation, life, and song. Fair is the sunlight, fair is still the moonlight, fair are all the twinkling hosts above. Jesus is purer, Jesus is fairer than all the angels, heavens, and both. See, that's what's going on. And so you get that kind of a light, frothy kind of a Jesus. It's kind of you and me hand to hand loving each other. See? That isn't it. That isn't it. All right, verse uh, 9. And this was manifest of the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. You understand that? That's self explanatory. Here in love, definition. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. You didn't love him first. He loved you first. Or you were saying you didn't love him. Somebody used his name as a cuss word. I did. One time, a little girl called up in Mama's lap, and the mother said, uh, Honey, you love me? And she said, Yeah, she said, I love you. And she said, Why do you love me? 
And the girl said, well, I guess I love you because you love me. Mother said, that hurts my feelings, she said. Just kidding, little girl. And the girl said, well, I guess the real reason I love you is because you love me first. See? And a lot of truth in that. We loved him because he loved us first. Uh, I can't imagine Jesus Christ going to cross and dying for me in the condition I was in before I was saved. I can't imagine. We'd come in drunk at night in the, in the off shower room. We'd always sing the old rugged cross, and I'd come to the garden alone. I don't know why drunks always pick those two songs. I guess because they have good harmony in them. <laughs> but we'd come in drunk at night, 11, 12 o'clock at night, go in there and stand in the shower and say, I come to the garden alone. All I do is still on the road, you know. And the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God, the throat. And he walks with me and talks with me and tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tire, we know what we're saying. Just, uh, I mean, I know what that thing means now. But back in those days, you know, just a good harmony. Barbershop. John about Fairbanks, Alaska. I knew a missionary from one time, oh, about 50 years ago. He told me about a character up there. Uh, maybe it was you. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he told about a character up there that would uh, be pretty rough. He told about a character up there that would go in those bars in Fairbanks and stand up in those tables on Wednesday night and give mock testimony meetings. And the guy would stand up there and say, Oh, Chris, I work testimony here at prayer meeting tonight, you know. And everybody get up, you know, guy get up and thank God for his companion in the sin and thank God for his bottle. Praise the Lord for his good whiskey, you know. <laughs> and you think, boy, the Lord ought to kill a guy like that. But he didn't. And that guy get up there and stagger around there and say, Prayer meeting tonight, who's got a good prayer, you know? Who wants a prayer, you know? That thing went on for months. And you think God would strike a guy like that with lightning, striking dead. You know what God did that fellow? He saved that fellow. <laughs> and the last time this missionary saw him, he was going in out of those bars, passing out tracks. Well, now we loved him because he first loved us. See? George Whitfield was a great preacher. And George Whitfield had a lot of adversaries and opponents. You don't read much about him in history, but, but every guy that ever stood for it just got it coming and going, man. There's no way to get around it. And George Whitfield, when he preached, there were about Three men used to follow him all over the country and make fun of him. And they'd imitate him. They'd have these big drunken parties, social parties, and all these high society folks from London. And these guys would get up and see who could give the best imitation of George Whitfield. And everybody would laugh and applaud, you know, and the guy that got the best one got the prize each night. And boy, one night, they got up there, and the first guy opened the Bible, you know, and got his text, took it by, just hit or miss, preached. Second guy did a little bit of applause. The third guy got up, just on the face, drunk. His Bible put his finger down and said, Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. <laughs> and he got up and preached. And the people there that night said, Never in their life have they ever heard a more terrible sermon than that on the horrors of hell. And one guy there said, It just made his blood run cold with his hair stand on end. He said, There's no time in his life he ever heard hell preached about with no grace. There was no grace in the preacher, he was unsafe. And there was no compassion because he didn't care. And he said, that guy got up and got into that text and something got a hold of him. And he said, point number one, all shall perish. Point number two, all those that repent won't perish. Point number three, except you repent, you'll perish. <laughs> and that guy preached that thing and something got a hold of him as his eyes began to stare and his mouth began to foam and it began to wave his fist and put out that thing, preached that thing for something like 35 or 40 minutes, and boy, when he got through, he was just standing there glaring out into space, and nobody applauded, nobody laughed, and that guy finished his message and said, and that's it, and got off the table and walked out the door, and 24 hours he was saved. He just preached himself right into heaven, man, just preached himself right out of conviction. <laughs> but you can't, you can't say that guy loved the Lord for the Lord loved him. All right, verse uh, 10, here in his love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. Not a propitiation, just one of them, but the propitiation for our sins. I pointed out the word the other day. It's a payment sent ahead except a situation between two parties. Beloved, if God so loved us, and he did, we ought also love one another, and we ought. We should. No man has seen God at any time. 
No, same thing in John 1, 1 18. No man is God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. Again, you have to watch out for John. If we love one another, God dwells in us. Well, God dwells in a Christian, even when he's not loving the brother. So before you've got to watch over John's application. If we, we'll have to say it practically. We'll say it practically. If we love one another, God dwells in us in the sense of comfortable in the home and not breathe, not quench. I was saying that it's going to put it in this age, and it's coming that way. And his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, witness of the Spirit, because he has given us of his Spirit. Now, I pointed out the other day about four ways you can know you're saved from First John. That's one of them. Hereby know we that we dwell in him. You want to do that? And he in us, by, because he has given us of his Spirit. Uh, you want to know the witness of the Spirit? Bow your head sometime and close your eyes and say, Lord, if I were to die tonight, where would I go? I know the Spirit come there and say, Hell. You say, Lord, that Spirit said, Hell. Does that Spirit confess that Jesus Christ come in the flesh? No. Lord, if I were to die tonight, where would I go? Would I go to heaven? Yes. Lord, that Spirit that said, Yes. That Spirit confess that Jesus Christ come in the flesh? Mm -hmm. You think I'm just talking? Try it. You bow your head and get pale on that way, and you watch the Holy Spirit bear witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. All right, verse 14. And we have seen, and I'll tell you something else. If you're not saved, you won't. If you're not saved, you bow your head and say, Lord, if I have night, if I go to heaven? Yes. That spirit that said that, yes. That spirit that said Jesus Christ on the flesh? No. Or would I, where would I go? You go to hell. You try to talk to yourself and you say, heaven, heaven, heaven. I go to heaven, I go. That spirit says, hell, hell. And I'll tell you something else. That spirit won't say Hades. He won't call an ASB. <laughs> He'll say hell. <laughs> yeah, the Holy Spirit, he knows which book's the right one. Well, I 13, hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen. Well, John saw him. Of course, he's talking about God in the flesh. When he says, no man has seen God at a time 12, he's talking about the eternal Father, like in John 1, 18. When he says in verse uh, 14, he's talking about God in the flesh. And we have seen and do testify the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Notice, uh, not the Savior of the elect. John Calvin off again. Savior of the world, not the elect. God is still over the world. Savior of the world, now the elect do this. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Well, of course, John has taken for granted what you found in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, that it's real. A man just saying Jesus the Son of God doesn't do it. I'll show you why it doesn't turn mark. When old John says confess, he's talking about something a little stronger than just saying something. Look at Mark 1, verse 24, and Mark 5. And notice that just saying Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that isn't a, a guarantee of salvation. Mark 5, Mark 1. All right, Mark 1, 24, the demons. Mark 1, 24. Saying, let us alone, what have I to, we, we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. The demons know that. Mark chapter 5, verse 7. Demons again. Mark 5, 7. And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? And God wasn't dwelling that man, unclean spirits were dwelling in. So when John says, Confess, He's talking about an honest confession and an honest, in the tribulation, an honest confession under pressure. In the tribulation, that thing will be a raise your right hand with two fingers up. Do you swear by God that this man standing in front of you is the Lord Jesus Christ? I do. Okay, take the mark. Right the head. Now raise your hand. Do you swear by this man is Jesus Christ come the flesh? No, he's not. Jesus Christ has already come in the flesh. <clears throat> Who's your head? See, that's why I say, oh, John, you've got to watch him. And John says, confess. See, 
He's talking about more than just the guy said, well, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I didn't admit. That thing is confession where John said, that confession there amounts to something, brother. And the tribulation now across the guy's head. Oh, I said, King, whoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. Again, God is love. Not love is God. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love, the kind of love of verse 10, dwelleth in God and God in him. Not talking about carnal love. Not talking about Hollywood love. Verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect. Why should you love God like you should? Here's how you do it. Herein is our love made perfect. No Christian can love the Lord like he should love him if he's not worried about losing his salvation. No Christian can. If you want to love God like you should, then quit worrying about going to hell. And God knows you've got 20,000 Christians in Ohio that live from day to day worrying about losing it. All right? Here in his love, our love made perfect. How is it? Well, it has to be made perfect that we may have boldness today of judgment. Second coming. White throne. Because as he is up there now, so are we in this world now. We'll read it and explain it. There is no fear in love. If you to love God like you should, there's no fear. Fear about what? The day of judgment. Now, he didn't say a fear about something else. In Philippians, he said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. See? So a Christian is to fear God, but not about the day of judgment. See? In other words, I should worry about my Christian life and my Christian service, but I don't ever have to worry about the day of judgment. Why? Because as he is, so am I in this world. You know, I'm going to get by the judgment just like the Lord Jesus Christ is going to get by it. You know why? Because when they have judgment, I'm going to be just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Sure, man. First John 3 says you're going to be like Christ before the millennium. How are you going to be at the right throne of judgment? Just like Jesus Christ. No Christian can love the Lord like he should love him if he's always worried about losing his salvation. No Christian can. If you want to love God like you should, then quit worrying about going to hell. And God knows you've got 20,000 Christians in Ohio that live from day to day worrying about losing it. All right? Here in his love, our love made perfect. How is it? Well, it has to be made perfect that we may have boldness the day of judgment. Second coming. White throne. Because as he is up there now, so are we in this world now. We'll read it and then explain it. There is no fear in love. If you really love God like you should, there's no fear. Fear about what? The day of judgment. Now, he didn't say a fear about something else. In Philippians, he said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. See? So a Christian is to fear God. But not about the day of judgment. See? In fact, words, I should worry about my Christian life and my Christian service, but I don't ever have to worry about the day of judgment. Why? Because as he is, so am I in this world. You know, I'm going to get by the judgment just like the Lord Jesus Christ is going to get by it. You know why? Because the day of judgment, I'm going to be just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Sure, man. First John 3 says you're going to be like Christ before the millennium. How are you going to get the right throne judgment? Just like Jesus Christ. All right, verse 18, there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. Poor Christians in Trenton and Middletown and Hamilton. I think if I want to live it, well, I used to live it, I don't anymore. I, I can save once, but I'm not saved now. I, I, I had a feeling, well, I, I never had to have a feeling again. Well, I went down there one night, and I know something happened to me. Torment, man, torment. You just rest. Listen, if you've received Jesus Christ your Savior, you're just good as in heaven with the door shut. And you might just well enjoy it, instead of being miserable. <laughs> I talked with a pastor's wife one time near here, and she was always worried about losing it. I still think she's kind of upset about it. And I talked to her one time, and I said, let me ask you something. I said, what you count on saving you? And she said, well, Brother Rupp, she said, I know what to say, but I just, uh, but I, I just, uh, I don't think I should say that, because I've just learned that. I said, okay, look at here. I said, suppose you drop dead right this minute. You want to go to hell? She said, no, no. I said, what you counting on keeping you out of hell? And she said, well, I know what to answer. I said, okay, don't answer me that. Tell me the truth. 
I mean, you're not, you don't want to go to hell, no. What are you counting on keeping you out of hell? And she said, well, the blood of Jesus Christ. And I said, I've got bad news for you. And she said, what's that? I said, you're not going to be able to go to hell. You're going to have to go to heaven. <laughs> and she said, what do you mean? I said, if you count above Jesus Christ to save you, you're going to heaven. So just quit trying to think you're going to make it to hell. You're not going to make it. There isn't a case where anybody ever went to hell that was counting the shed blood of Jesus Christ they their soul. And if there is, nobody in this room is saved. You just go to hell with the door shut. So don't worry about that either. <laughs> And if you go to hell, nothing can do about it, so don't worry about that. And if you go into heaven, praise the Lord, so don't worry about that. God's people, they torment themselves, that kind of business. I told you before, I'll tell you again about a color lady I saw down south one time. I know these things are, uh, you know, you hear these things before, but it makes such an impression on you. I saw a color lady going down the street like this, and she had a little white boy in her hand. He was about four years old, and she was taking him someplace. I don't know where, but some white woman, you know, get told to take that kid someplace. And she's taken him. And she weighed about 230 pounds, and she was dragging that kid down the street, and his feet were hitting the street about once every four steps. And he was just screaming and hollering, bloody murder. And that old color lady was going, la, she 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 that's a picture of the Holy Spirit taking one of these Christians to heaven and she's going to lose it. <laughs> and you know something? You can holler and scream and squall all you want, but the Lord is going to get you home. And you might just well reconcile yourself to it instead of hollering and raising chain about it. 18. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts about fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. You talk about love, 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 okay? If you doubt your salvation and think you can live, don't talk to me about love. You know nothing about it. If you love God like you should, you know he's true to his word. He's dumb and necessary to get you there, and he's going to get you there. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, there must be some connection, but I've heard, of, I've heard a lot about these uh, hard shell branches preachers down in Kentucky and Tennessee that they continually preach on hell and judgment. And they're very seldom they preach on the love of God. Uh, how much do you find that? Well, that's true. Some of those fellows are putting fear and torment in the fellow who's already saved. A hard shell Baptist, a primitive Baptist, who spends all the time on that, is eventually he'll talk some Christian into thinking that he hasn't been saved. Yeah, no, that's right. Not one of the elect. Now, I'll show you how to do that. Now, at our school, when a guy comes in there, we tell him we're a moderate dispensationalism and a moderate Calvinism. That's what we tell a fellow. The reason why we tell a fellow that is if a man is not a modern Calvinist, he can get in some bad trouble in this country today. Now, without naming any names, but I have right in mind a uh, uh, pastor who's going to be a pastor in the next few months, and uh, we're from Mississippi. I have in mind an evangelist. So went to a modernistic Southern Baptist seminary and got saved, but now tracks all over the country, which is good. I think it's one of them. I have in mind a writer on revival who I'll be in a Bible conference with in about two months. Like a fellow said, he writes more about revival not to have one than I ever saw in my life. And those fellows there, and, uh, and a guy named L.R. Shelton, who's now dead, and Bob Ross and Gilpin, Kentucky, ba Kentucky Baptist Examiner, and uh, Rolf Barnard, who's now dead, and Caldwell in South Carolina, who taught Rolf Barnard, a good many of them. And the action of evangelists that come to those fellows, some of them connect with the work over in Louisiana. I'll tell you what's going on. Uh, I was an evangelist for 11 years, so I know what's going on. Now, I don't want to talk like a fool and brag about it, but you know something, if a fellow in the full-time evangelism for 11 years and full-time pastor for 11 years, he'll know something. <laughs> now, if he don't know nothing, something's bad wrong, man. And I was out there for 11 years, and I'll tell you what I saw. I saw television just take the local churches and destroy them. And when that thing went on, the big churches began to build up here, and the big ones here, kind of a supermarket, and sent out buses and drained the local churches. And I saw all the spiritual movement getting channeled into one big city here, one big city here, and then all over the country the local churches just fold up by the thousands. And when I say fold up, some close the doors. 
Uh, you'll never know till you get to heaven how many Southern Baptist churches literally shut the door and sold the property in the last 20 years. Country churches with thousands of them. And as that thing went on, when I was in evangelism, I'd come into churches Monday night, Christians. Tuesday night, Christians. Wednesday night, Christians. Thursday night, Christians. Friday night, Christians. No one saved. Well, how can I turn in my report to the sword of the Lord? We had 28 conversions, and there's nobody there to get converted. See? And you know, the days of revival are not past. The week can have revival this time. Why local churches? Baloney. Baloney. The old boy went around to more late big churches to get in, got at him, and then reap their crop. Well, who are we trying to kid? You take when some of these fellows start out, they didn't go to Springfield. They went to Baylor. They went to Baylor when they started out. They weren't independent Baptists. They just watch Independent Baptist build a big church. I should like to get in there. I'll give him some publicity. <laughs> Who are we trying to kid? And I was out there preaching to those churches, Christians Monday night. You know, some of us folks didn't get saved before we 27. Hard to get along with. We're mean. I mean, we just see right flat through it. He that increases wisdom and increases sorrow. I wish I didn't see as well as I see. Ignorance is bliss. Like ignorance of cutting wood, instance. <laughs> with one of those old fellows. And you know, Monday night Christian, Tuesday night Christian, Wednesday night Christian, I used to get so downhearted. I came back to, to Greenville, South Carolina. We'll get those primitive Baptists in a minute. And we came back to Greenville, South Carolina one time, and, and I saw a big old picture there that said, 130 first-time decisions, Monk Parker, Union Campaign, 35 churches in Greater Greenville Crusade, you know. And I was out in Mohawk, Tennessee. I was preaching at Presbyterian Church in Mohawk, Tennessee. We had one to say 14 years old, one little girl say seven, that was it, man. The offer wasn't enough to get your bus fare back. And I came back and then read that paper, and I thought, boy, man, I'd never been called to be an evangelist. Good night, I can't do that, you know. And I was coming down the dumps, my good friend, old Glenn Shunk, that actually got me preaching. Glenn Shunk, he converted Catholic. He was the old Deutsch company, you know. And Glenn Shunk says, oh, so don't worry about that. He says, I went to that meeting every night. I said, look at him, man, 130 first time, the 130 people got saved. He said, he don't say saved. I said, well, first time decision. Well, he said, if he said 80 of them, he said, we're for family order. And he said, 20 of them were first time for tithing. And he said, of the 30 that were left, he said, 15 of them were first time decisions to, to sell out to God. And the other 15 were a bunch of kids that got saved in a children's rally Sunday afternoon. I'll tell you, man, I'll tell you, I just got, I just got enough of just old infantry left in me that I just don't appreciate all that crooked stuff. Amen. And just because the guy was a godly, dedicated, soul-winning, good man of God with a great... I don't believe it! 